Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad that you're with us today to stay curious. We have got lunacy on our mind, a beautiful full moon picture behind me over here, I guess. Uh, my friend Steve Rissmiller took that photo. We've used it a couple times, but it just never uh, bothers me to keep looking at this beautiful image of the full moon there. And full moon is Tuesday morning, actually, in the middle of the night tonight, Monday. And get out there with your binoculars. I was showing some people at an event Saturday the moon through their binoculars. Just because uh, everyone has binoculars. And you're going to see it even better than Galileo saw it with eight power binoculars on there. In fact, the moon is 248,000 miles away from us right now. That's kind of at the, at the farthest away of its elliptical orbit. And we're going to talk about that super full moon that this one's not when it's close to Earth, closer, like 230,000 miles away. But we're going to go through some, eh, maybe some familiar pictures you've seen before. But as I talk about the moon every year, three or four times, I like highlighting different things. So I never know what I'm going to say each time. It's going to be a little different. Glad that you're all with us today to kick off another great week of Stay Curious with my co-producer and friend, Marty Winkle. Marty, how are you today? And we have Connie, Connie in, the in the studio, studio helping out today. today. She's, She's pushing, pushing the, the button, button on the UCAC mic. And uh, they're just all waving that they're fine. So uh, I won't interrupt them there, but we thank uh, Connie wanting to help us here. And Marty has been with us now for coming up on three years, Marty, 766 episodes with today's program. So we want to let you know that we've got some great programs lined up uh, for this week. You're not going to want to miss on Tuesday. We've got Dr. Gary Stuti here. He's an astrobiologist, going to talk about growing plants in space. Two Garys this week, Gary Allgaier. You've seen Gary before. Gary Stuti was on the show over a year ago. Gary Allgaier has been on uh, the past uh, several weeks talking about things as his he's a NASA uh, engineer that deals with uh, the physical. Anything that doesn't have electrons or fluid going through them. Uh, he has something to do with. And then Terry White is going to make another appearance on Stay Curious Thursday. And we're going to talk about the first return to flight, folks. That's right, STS-2. All right, not after the Columbia or Challenger disaster return to flight. So we're going to talk about flying Columbia for the second time. And Terry White said it was had a lot of challenges to get STS-2 off the ground in November 1981. And then this uh, Friday we'll edge it. We'll have shuttles of March and and uh, catch up with uh, all of the space shuttles that have been launched in the month of March, all to bridge the space between us, of course. So, well, as promised, I'm going to bring you a lot of moonshine on today's program. All right, of course, that's the kind of moonshine that you can't get too much of. So, uh, it all started with me and the moon. I would really say, though, um, uh, I was a youngster back then this is walt disney and watching the walt disney uh wonderful world of disney on sunday nights all of us became educated to things that we never saw before whether it be uh african uh, wildlife or oceans or or the moon and here is walt uh never the same looking at the moon okay after this this is 1955 all right when they had their man in space televised show which I was a little young to be watching this. Maybe I was in diapers watching it. But I just wanted to point out in 1955, 67, uh, 68 years ago, 42 million Americans watched this special program, Man in Space, with Warner Von Braun and, and Walt Disney and Von Braun explaining how we were going to go to the moon and then Mars. 1955. 42 million Americans watched that. There were only 4 million television sets in America at the time. That's an incredible, over 10 people watching every uh, TV set uh, that was on at the time. So uh, these are the type of inspirations that, you know, are, are latent images in my uh, growing up. And that's why I'm a lunatic for the moon, all right? And here we have a beautiful moonrise over... One of the hotels here on the uh, Coco, actually, that's over, um, that's the Radisson, I think, down at uh, uh, Satellite Beach. 
in there a photo i took of the red moon coming up it even looks a little obli uh, obli you know a little wobbly there not a complete sphere because of atmospheric distortion and that's what causes the moon to be red is the uh, the uh, po pollution in the sky but it's also a great example of the moon illusion all right where the moon looks gigantic but I was just telling a group of people Saturday looking at the moon. You hold your little finger at arm's length. You can always cover the moon up with your little pinky. All right. Always. All right. It's a half a degree across. So it looks so gigantic tonight and tomorrow night rising up over the mountains, over a building, over trees, over the ocean. It, you can always cover it with your little finger. Even that that uh, uh, super full moon, and this is a super full moon that my buddy Steve Rissmiller photographed, but I show a pizza pie to emphasize that a super full moon, all right, is, and I got my pizza box here, Marty, super full moon, if it was a 10 inch pizza, okay, the super full moon would only be a 10 and a half inch pizza, okay, delivered to you. So uh, it's not that big. Uh, the regular full moons, like a 10 inch pizza and a super full moon would be a 10 and a half inch pizza. All right. So, but it's a little bit, it's, it's uh, almost over 10% brighter. And uh, you might notice that sometimes in there. So, well, the Native Americans are the ones, of course, here in North America that we hear a lot of their legends, but the legends are all over the world in China. Europe, Australia, they all have their own legends about what they see in the features of the moon and those features being the dark areas that scientists know were lava plains three to a billion years ago that, that dried up and looked like uh, frozen uh, oceans or maria, Latin for sea. And the, the Native Americans, though, named all of the full moons. They were very important to them, like all cultures, because the brighter the moon at night allowed them to be out harvesting, hunting, even having more fun at night. And uh, I, I implore you to go out in the moonlight. And those of you in the north that are experiencing the still uh, harsh winter storms or snow and so forth, I miss, frankly, it being about 10 degrees outside and getting all bundled up and going outside and being in a, a field or in the mountains with a lot of snow around you. The moon's out glistening all over the place. It's got an eth ethereal uh, feel to it, uh, a little bit of spiritual to me. And because uh, no one's out there, all right, particularly if you're in an open field or so, so forth, and the moonlight's coming down on you, and you hear the crunching of the snow underneath you. So I'm getting pretty poetic here about it, but I want you to kind of capture some of that moonshine there, these moonbeams that I love so much. The moon's phases were the first thing that caveman probably noticed that changed in the sky after it the, this big bright thing came up and made it bright and then uh, uh during the daytime the sun and then it disappeared and then it got dark and then it got lighter out in the nighttime when they saw the moon up but of course the cycle of the moon is because the earth is going a thousand miles an hour east but the moon's going over two thousand miles an hour east so like a nascar oval track every 29 and a half days it laps the, the, the field, so to speak, because it's going a thousand miles an hour than the earth and everything on the earth. So beautiful pictures there showing us our moon phases. And the, the Native Americans gave a name to the full moons, again, so important to them. The full moon of uh, uh, March is the worm moon in many cultures because worms started coming out of the ground. They would see the birds picking at them and eating them. Uh, the, the, the ground was starting to thaw out and things were starting to get back to warmth. Uh, the full moon of April is the pink moon because there were so many flocks, pink flocks, flowers were all over the place, all right? It's also called the Paschal moon, the April moon, uh, Easter moon, if Easter is in there. And of course we have Easter is, um, uh, April, it's the first weekend of April. I think it's the 7th. No, it's the 5th, actually. No, it's the, 
The 15th is a Saturday because that's our shuttle fest. So seven from that, I guess it's April 8th will be Easter. So uh, you could call the April full moon the Paschal moon. Full moon of May, flower moon, strawberry moon is June for all you people up north. But boy, we're getting our bellies full of some delicious strawberries down here right now. And then you got the buck moon of uh, July and so forth and so on. And you got a lot of cultures and even science fiction, howling at the moon, werewolves and such. And the blue moon. Who can forget? Once in a blue moon. All right. Connie will be here to do our stream labs. And I'm just poking at her there. But that means once in a while or once uh, in a blue moon, technically a blue moon. And this is a moon that I tinted blue. Okay. You'll never, ever see the moon blue like this. I just colorize it with Photoshop. Uh, but it's two full moons in the same month, and we have that happening uh, this month. Uh, uh, in August, I think, this year, we have two full moons in it there. And Marty, would you get me my notes off the printer over there that I printed out and didn't go? So, the sliver of the moon. Uh, we talk about the moon. Uh, astronomers do an age of the moon. Is If I say the moon is 14 days old, you know that it's full moon. All right. We basically... They, they, they think of the moon as a 28-day phase, okay? Those are really 29 and a half days. But if I say the moon's seven days old, that's first quarter, all right? If I say that the moon is uh, uh, 15 days old, that's a day after full moon, and you know it's still going to be big and bright in the sky in the gibbous phase on there. In fact, the moon rises today at uh, 645, all right? And uh, so um, it won't be up to good to about 7 o'clock to be seen good today. But at 645, you're out there and the sun sets and you see the, uh, it could just be very, very beautiful. And the line between night and day of a moon right there is called the Terminator. Not Arnold Schwarzenegger, nothing to do with him. It is the Terminator is the line between night and day. And this is like a uh, five-day-old moon, a couple days before first quarter. We call that about a five-day-old moon. That's where you see the details, just like we do in the twilight on Earth. In fact, the Terminator of Earth is what we call twilight, evening twilight and morning twilight. And you notice how the shadows are nice and appealing to you when you're looking in the morning or evening. That's why, you know, I love the evening twilight. Some people get up early and, and they're mesmerized by the morning twilight. At noon, there's not many shadows and, and objects kind of look boring outside. So keep that in mind when you're uh, stargazing and that when the moon is, uh, you, you don't see a lot of shadows. You don't see any shadows at full moon. That's really the worst time to look at the moon to see details. But there's other things you can see on the full moon that you can't see any other time. The moon is half the size of Mars, which is half the size of Earth, okay? Mars is in the middle there, and we don't think of these three like this, but Mars is so big in our mind, and uh, I was looking at it uh, last night, and it's just so tiny, yet uh, a month ago, you could see the cloud uh, 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 clouds on top of it, the polar caps is what you could see. You couldn't see clouds, but you could see polar caps on there, so... Um, uh, ah, the dark side of the moon, okay. And uh, many of us that grew up in the 60s know that that's a very famous album by the group Pink Floyd. But there is no dark side of the moon. It's the back side of the moon, all right. It gets illuminated just like the earth, the, 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 the side facing the earth does. In fact, here's a satellite that took a picture of the back side of the moon there, and it's new moon. If we were looking at the earth, okay, the earth looking at it, you would see that uh, it, you wouldn't see the moon because it's new moon there. So this is what the moon looks like uh, from a geosynchronous satellite. Actually, uh, 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 the moon's 240,000 miles away. This was actually taken by a, a satellite that was past the orbit of the earth and moon there. Love that picture, though. So, the left is the front side of the moon that you're familiar with, all right? 
I see a woman in the moon right there. I don't know if you do. Some civilizations see uh, a rabbit, an elk, a man in the moon. I'm going to show you the woman in the moon in a minute. But there's nothing to see on the back side of the moon. It is heavily cratered with just one little lava sea there. That's uh, the Moscow Sea, named by the Russians. So why is it different? We're not exactly sure. There's a lot of theories. One is that when the moon stopped its spinning and was kind of frozen in its orbit, uh, to face the Earth, uh, uh, one side of it, like a lot of planets, uh, like moons orbiting other planets do, that the gravity of the Earth kind of oozed out the uh, the, the the lava underground uh, that way. But it's still open to conjecture. That's why we want to go back to the moon. By the way, at the bottom of the moon, right down here, okay, where I'm pointing on both globes, that is where we're going to land, Artemis at the bottom of the moon and those craters down there, some of them never get sunlight. So we know that there's ice at the bottom of them buried. Well, at the top is the moon we see up the upper right the backside. And then the bottom two pictures are like turning at three quarters, all right? If it was frozen three quarters, uh, particularly on the right-hand side here, this is a, 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 a impact basin of rings that would actually look like a big eye looking at, at, at the earth if that had been frozen facing us. Do you know China has two rovers on the moon? That's right. This is a rover called U-2, Y-U-T-U, and it's the number two, the uh, second one that is still survived after four years. It's actually called Chang-4. It's got two parts, a lander and a rover. The rover began its exploration uh, in uh, 2013, Okay, uh, and it uh, 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 that was the Chang 3, was in 2013. Chang 4 uh, is currently operational as the longest lived lunar rover and the first lunar rover traversing the far side of the moon. That's a, a, an illustration by a, a uh, artist. This is a real photo, though, of it off its lander going over to a lunar crater. All right. Um, uh, the rover uh, has quit operating, but the landing station is working. That's what it is. The mission lander is operational after four years and still counting. Now, that's a, a big deal because for two weeks, of course, it's in shadow and 200 below zero. And then for two weeks, it's 200 above zero. So, uh, China's learning how to keep things alive on the moon in their ambitious space program with three humans on their space station right now. Uh, they could be landing on the moon before the Artemis. Well, I alluded to the different shapes and, and things that were seen in the moon by the dark maria that again are just lava plains of frozen lava. We landed on several of those because they were smooth and, and yet there's... there's uh, even down to inches, you see craters everywhere because there's no atmosphere on the moon. So everything, all the micrometeorites just pulverize it. So there you got rabbits, you got elk, bison are seen in the moon. And in this beautiful picture of the moon that I took, uh, you can see as I outline the outline of a profile of a woman in the moon. And the pendant she's wearing is the crater Tycho. And uh, she's got her hair in a bun. And again, another full moon picture. Connie's shaking her head. She doesn't see that. Uh, but that, there she is again. She's even got blue eyes and red lips there. All right. But uh, there it is there. There it is there. So the woman in the moon. And I, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. But go out and see the woman in the moon tonight. I think you'll get it. You know, the first person to turn a telescope to the moon was Galileo in 1609, 414 years ago. The first person to see that it was not a pure uh, structure. It had uh, marks all over it. And these are some of Galileo's first uh, drawings of the moon. And I encourage people that in this very high-tech scientific world, to maybe be low tech like I do and just make a sketch of lunar craters. This is Mare Iridium, the sea of rainbows 
with a couple craters on its floor and a little what they call a rill, a raised area of lava there. And uh, I enjoy doing these sketching. Uh, and there are certain times that you look at these mountains that have got sh very sharp, okay, shadows from those mountain peaks that you're seeing there. You don't know it's Twin Peaks here until you These, these uh, places are called. The moon is a destination with names on it. There's the Central Bay, the Marsh of Decay up at the top. That's uh, Mare Putrid Tatis, okay? The word putrid uh, meaning decay. They named, uh, they, the early cartographers or selenographers of the moon, they named a lot of features after those on Earth, including the mountains. The Apennine Mountains on the moon are about three miles high. All right, and there's some of the highest there. The Sea of Vapors, all right? Think about that. And here's looking at the moon at one of the landing sites. There's a blue dot there about in the middle of the enlarged picture on a rill. That is where Apollo 15 landed with David Scott and Jim Irwin, and Dave Scott's still with us. We celebrate those lunar landings at Space View Park with our beautiful statue of President Kennedy out there and over... 30 handprints of astronauts in bronze. Most of the, all of the moonwalkers there, a few of them had passed away like Pete Conrad. But here's all the stuff that we've put on the moon. The yellow are the Apollo landing sites. The green are the Russian unmanned landing sites. And America's surveyor unmanned landers are in the blue there. More objects than you think. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, 12, about 20 objects have landed safely on the moon there. And of course, a whole bunch of them have crashed. And there is to remind us that when you look at that moon, men have walked there. In fact, that one of those men in the background, there is uh, uh, John Young with the only telescope taken to the surface of the moon. Uh, that gold telescope is an X-ray telescope that was quite successful. And my good friend and our co-producer, Marty Winkle, was involved with Grumman and he helped wire electrically all these lunar rovers that Grumman built. And there's the instant when he had his fingers crossed, maybe, as the guillotine had to split pipes and cables at an exact instant to separate the upper module from the lower module of the lunar module. And there they are headed back uh, to uh, dock with the mothership orbiting the Earth. We did that we saw this three times because of the rovers that were on the moon had cameras to show us that. How cool is that? Our heroes, if you grew up like me, you know all of them by name there, okay? And only four of them are still alive with us, okay? And that would be uh, two on the bottom row. Right beside me is Harrison Schmidt and Gene Cernan's gone, but there's Charlie Duke. What a great guy. Privilege to have met him. Uh, 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 of course, well, let's go left or right. You got up the top, there's Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Buzz is 93 years old. We lost Pete Conrad and, and Alan Bean on Apollo 12. Uh, uh, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell on Apollo 14 are no longer with us. Dave Scott on Apollo 15. And Jim Irwin has passed away, but Dave Scott, the commander, is alive. There you've got the bottom left. John Young passed away and... Uh, he grew up in Orlando. There's a John Young Parkway there and Charlie Duke. And then Gene Cernan passed away a couple of years ago and Harrison Schmidt. Schmidt and Duke are the two youngest. They're, they're 87 years old, the two youngest moonwalkers, all right? this all, We're going to lose them all here quicker than you can think about it, unfortunately. But we keep their memory alive on Stay Curious and so many places around the world that celebrate them. A box of rocks. There's a special box of rocks. Basalt is a mixture of different rocks kind of fused together, like the field uh, breccia is the same way. Uh, uh, anthracites. Uh, same kind of language used on earth rocks, but uh, they were formed somewhat differently. And I tried to steal a rock one time, a moon rock. Ha, ha, ha. There's my good friend, uh, uh Paul Lewis, uh, he's a University of Tennessee outreach astronomer, 
and was always privileged to have this moon rock and a little plastic Pyrex in his pocket. And boy, did he have a hard time getting it back from me when I got to show it off to people there. But uh, what a cool thing. NASA has programs that they loan rocks so people can actually hold them in their hand. And that was an Apollo 16 white anthroscopic or arthroscopic rock. And we would not be talking about the moon without some of our great friends and supporters of the American Space Museum. Artist Chris Calley, one of his piece de resistance images of the end of the program, the last boot on the moon. Chris, thank you for being such a great partner of the American Space Museum, as well as Doug Forrest. Doug's watching in Los Angeles. I know he is. And here's a beautiful pen. Uh, or pen, uh, pencil uh, sketch, uh, more than a sketch. This man spent hours and hours on this. Of course, the famous golf ball shot by Alan Shepard on Apollo 14 as depicted by Doug Forrest. And you can't be a photographer and not want to take pictures of the moon. Of course, I've been a professional all my life. The tough part of being a photographer and shooting the moon is getting that exposure right to where you see the Maria, all right, aren't blown out and you're just looking at a flashlight in the in the uh, in the sky. Okay, that's the technique, folks. If you're a, a shutter bug and wanting to get the moon against a landscape like I did here, uh, the lighting has to be right. Uh, uh, the moon's in the sky a couple of days. This is probably a 12 day old moon. Remember, 14 days is full. The literature, the movies, just think about all of our influence in pop culture, starting with From Earth to the Moon in the 1800s by Jules Verne. And even it's, it's still, that, that inspired people to maybe make a cannon that would be fo uh, fired at the moon, like the Jules Verne movie did. It was really a, a concept at the time to try to build a cannon that could launch something all the way to the moon. And now I'm hungry. All right. So, yep, we got some moon pie. Wash it down with a little bit of moonshine. Nah, I don't drink. So I'm going to take some moon water with me, okay, and, and wash down my moon pie. And uh, we're, you're going to be hearing a lot about moon water, okay. We're uh, uh, And uh, we've got an entrepreneur in town, Denise Gibson. Hope you're watching. We're going to start promoting her moon water for us there. So you can eat your moon pie, drink your moon water, and be humming Moon Shadow. My favorite moon song, of course, uh, Moon Dance is another good one by uh, uh, Who Did Moon Dance? I'm talking too quick here. Van Morrison did Moon Dance and Cat Stevens' Moon Shadow. Do you know there's over 100 songs with moon in the title? Oh, yeah. Picasso Moon by uh, the Grateful Dead's another favorite one of mine there. And uh, so, uh, and then, of course, the stamps about the moon. And this is Chris Kelly's father, Paul uh, uh, Inc., uh, Inc. This, this very beautiful and famous uh, stamp in 1969 when a stamp could only cost you 10 cents. All right, in there. So, hope you're all enjoying our little program here on the moon today. Uh, Doug Forrest is watching. Glad you are, Doug. Robert Law, great to see you uh, watching, Robert, in Dundee, Scotland. Dave Stangy's, uh-oh, Dave Stangy's in town, Marty. He's in Florida. Larry Pusker's coming soon, and we hope to see these two uh, followers of Stay Curious uh, in our studio on Thursday. Dave Stangy's going to come by. We got uh, Terry White here, but we'll probably pull Dave over here so you can uh, see his face there, and he's enjoying a Florida vacation from his home in Michigan. Carlton Bailey's watching. Hey, CB. Steve Hammer, William Whiting, Gary Gerald, Tom Usiak, James Michael Sigler, and Mark Usiak made it home to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, just in time for the latest ice storm, uh, probably. But... Uh, well, we set a record 91 degrees here yesterday, folks. It was uh, uh, interesting for uh, first week of March, for sure. Bear in mind, we have almost 90 days in a row of 90. So uh, I'm going like, hey, I'm not quite ready for this. But um, anyway, we hope that everybody's enjoyed a little bit of moonshine today. I'm going to go out here bragging a little bit about 
some of the photography that I've enjoyed doing, a couple of my favorite shots of the moon there. I remember specifically seeing the moon in this big uh, tower of, 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 of electrical wires and did a U-turn to go around and get this shot. So I tell you photographers out there, you see it, take it, because you might not ever see it again. All right, so, uh, uh, and uh, so then we got another picture that I'm quite proud of is moonshine over the Bristol Motor Speedway a few years ago at the night race uh, when they would sell out full capacity there. Uh, they hardly do that now. 150,000 people, the cars on the bottom of the track, just just moving a little bit there, probably about a half a second exposure with the moon that does look like a bright flashlight there. Couldn't balance that Maria too well there uh, over the South Holston Mountains of the Appalachians there. And one other brag shot there is the full moon over my hometown courthouse. It's the Hancock County statue of, of John Hancock there. And uh, just to remind everybody that uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. All right. So as the clock says there. So well, we're all going to be excited to what's going to be happening in the next uh, uh, few years as Artemis and NASA want to take us back to the moon. Who knows, Marty, what will be greeting them there when they get back? I'm not sure uh, when the uh, starship lands. And folks, it's not being emphasized enough, in my opinion, that this is the ship that we're going to land on the moon. Okay. Uh, they're just, say, a couple people. They're not saying how many people. This thing will fit 30. All right. But uh, this is the, what has the contract is the Starship. Look at the bottom. There's the people on the bottom. There's even a rover down there. And uh, so uh, they're way at the top. 200 feet up is where the crew is. So they're going to have to have, they're already working on some elevators and so forth. But this is a concept not proven yet. But uh, as we've talked about on Stay Curious, Elon Musk got the money to just keep building them and destroying them until they work and get in Earth orbit and he'll make it work to land on the moon. But this is what's going to attach to the gateway and the Orion is just the Uber to take astronauts up to the gateway and then land on the moon in this. What do you think they'll see when they get there, Marty? Alice Cramden, maybe? Don't think so. Don't think so? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No Alice Cramden. And uh, that's a reach for some of you, as we old timers know, the Honeymooners and Jackie Gleason, Art Carney, and that great staff was a joke that he was going to send Alice to the moon with a haymaker. Of course, we don't want to hit women or anything. Uh, but uh, back in the day, it was fun to make a joke about it. So uh, we hope that you've enjoyed staying curious with us on my little bit of lunacy today. And we hope that you come back and see us tomorrow with Dr. Gary Studi, Growing Plants in Space. This is the world's expert on astrobiology okay make no uh, uh qualms about that he talks all over the world and i'm i'm happy to call him my personal friend and he's been a friend of karen conklin our executive director for many years here and gary allgaier is going to be wednesday and terry wright thursday and if that's not enough to keep you curious then nothing will that's all i got to say all right so uh there yeah, let's go have another sip of moonshine marty and uh, uh, get our Monday going here. Uh, again, anything we have to button up on our Streamlabs program over there, folks? No, not really, except Carlton wants to know where his moon picture is. Where is Carlton's moon picture? Moon uh, rocket, I'm sorry, moon rocket. It's in the can. It's on the cutting room floor, Carlton. But we'll get it in there. I tell you what, let's put Godzilla and the moon together next time I get into a little lunacy. You know I am because I can't resist talking about the full moon a couple times a year, maybe three or four times a year, because I want you all to understand that it's there for you to enjoy in so many ways. And it has inspired mankind since caveman to the latest Hollywood blockbuster, uh, The Martian uh, or well, we haven't done one about the moon, but the latest Hollywood blockbuster is it being filmed right now at Kennedy Space Center. Marty, you've been out there and seen those A-list actors. Maybe we'll talk about that some with you tomorrow. Until then, thank you for my staff here for helping us do uh, Stay Curious. We are blessed 
uh, approaching three years. Uh, we're just blessed that you enjoy it. Please tell your friends to like us on Facebook and YouTube. Watch us on YouTube as we're monetizing that. So until tomorrow, when we are going to have a wonderful talk with Gary Studi, astrobiologist, all about the food we're going to take to space. You're not going to want to miss that. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying, I can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us.